Okay, so what I wanted to present to you and discuss was should the police be in the business of making money? This is really what we're asking. Should the police be in the business of making money? Most people would say no, but that's exactly what's happening with police proactive stings. So let's take a look at that. Okay, I guess I just hit return. Okay, so for the next hour, I'm going to introduce myself, tell you a little bit about what happened to me and my son, and explain to you what ICAC is, how it got started, what it was created for. Then I'm going to do a little scientific analysis, which is going to go off of Jill's earlier discussion, which deals a lot with biases and uh, how to use them against justice. Against justice is what I would call it. And we're going to end up with what is it can, that you can do to try to help fight against these things. So I was drafted into this fight in 2017 when my son was entrapped in a police proactive sting in the state of Washington. A lot of you know how this feels, you know how this went. I had no clue, of course, like all of you. So um, I do now consider this to be a government conspiracy, which I will explain to you later why I got to that conclusion. It's pretty upsetting. Um, but the police and the media use fear mongering um, to try to get, just like with the registration, try to get the public set against persons labeled with this. So as I started to advocate, and I've had some success uh, getting the word out about what's going on, my first, my first attempt was a billboard in the state of Washington. It didn't get very much response, <laughs> but you know, I saw the movie, three billboards outside of Abbey. Yeah, and so that's what I first tried. Um, uh, my group was led into an article in the New York Times in which my son and my story was told. Up. Oh. And I talk really, really fast because I'm from Illinois, Chicago. Um, so uh, we were, my son and I were, um, <laughs> that's okay, were highlighted in an article from the New York Times, um, and I can explain some more about that later. We were also on the Dr. Phil show advocating against proactive stings. And I did a podcast with Mike Morse, who happens to be the attorney for Chris Hansen, out of To Catch a Predator. Um, those were kind of some of the things that I've done so far to try to raise awareness. I also, originally when this happened to me, reached out with Florida Action Committee, who is an amazing organization, and NARSOL themselves. But I found that this is kind of a niche within the group, and nobody was really um, being direct about what was happening within this niche. It's, it's the same, but it's different. And uh, so I started my blog in which I explained what we were going through, what the steps were, and how it made us feel, and blah, blah, blah. And I also started an organization with two other families out of the state of Washington. The three of us started a group called CAGE, Citizens Against Government Entrapments. It's been going for about a year, and we have one of our coworkers here to help me and another on their way. So. Most of the information I'm going to present is out of the state of Washington because that's where it happened to me. But I have found through advocating across the country that this is happening in every state. So to give you some of the background and so I don't have to answer every question, Florida Action Committee had a uh, campaign where they were trying to show how the family members were affected by the original trauma. And so I worked with them and created this video. And here it is. Do I have to do that? I don't think so. I think I can just click it. Hey mom, can I borrow the car tonight? My name is Kathleen Hambrick. This is my story. I decided to have my son later in life because I didn't want to worry about finances or building a career. I wanted to, to focus on being a mother. My son is a lot like me. He's funny and <laughs> nerdy and uh, introverted, and he's a little socially inept. Growing up in the age of computers, he was naturally drawn to video games and eventually he got into role play games and fantasies such as Dungeons and Dragons, and he still plays them today. On a rainy night in February, my son came home from one of his two jobs and said, hey mom, can I borrow the car tonight? 
He was very excited. He had met someone online, and I was happy that he was actually going out of the house instead of sitting on the computer all night. So I gave him a hug, I gave him the car keys, and I said, be safe, don't stay out too late. He didn't come home that night. And by the morning, I was frantic and pacing, and I called the non-emergency 911 line, and they suggested that I check the hospitals and the local jails. And I had never thought about checking the jails because my son had never been in trouble. And uh, I did check online and his name was listed on a roster in the county next to us. And next to it, it said attempted rape of a child. I was like, what? <laughs> this is a mistake. Uh, so after I bailed him out and got him home, he told me what really happened. He said that he had gone on to Craigslist looking for a date or a one night stand. And he had run across an ad that said gamer girl. Of course, that was a real big draw for him. And uh, he started chatting with this woman. And a few sentences into the conversation, she said, I'm 13. And his reply to her was, what do you mean you're 13? You're on an adult site. Do you mean 23? Well, she didn't actually answer him. All she said was, I like college guys. So being confused, he said he asked her to send him a, a picture. And she did. And the picture was of a 24 year old woman. So he kind of just thought she was playing a fantasy role play, which is something he did all the time. So he proceeded to continue to talk to her. And an hour and a half later, she again says, I'm 13. By this point, he knows he's talking to an adult. You can tell <laughs> a lot of things when you talk to someone for an hour and a half. And this was all text messages. So he arranged to meet her. When he got there, just as a last ditch effort to make sure this was not a child, he said, could you come out front before I come inside? Smart boy. She did come out front. He was absolutely right. It was an adult female, the female from the picture. He walked inside and he was arrested for <laughs> attempted rape of a child. I don't understand it. I don't quite follow their logic, but that's what happened. In the state of Washington, the charge of attempted rape of a child, when you have no prior criminal record, will get you six to 10 years with lifetime probation and lifetime parole. Seems a little harsh, but that's what it is. There was no investigation done into whether my child was actually looking for another child or not. There was, uh, nobody came to the house, nobody looked through his things, nobody tried to find other potential victims if he was this monster that they said he was. But the judge didn't care about any of that. All the judge heard was 13. He didn't care that he was sent a picture of an adult. He didn't care that he had asked the woman to come out front and it was an adult woman. He didn't care that he was on an adult site. The judge didn't care at all. And we really hadn't anticipated Jace being convicted. And then he was. And when the judge said the words guilty, we were floored. My son turned to look at me and I had started to bawl and my sisters were there for support. And my son broke down and I saw my son break down and he came to me and I hugged him and I rubbed the back of his head, which is something I've always done. And uh, I just whispered in his ear and rocked him and said, be strong and I won't leave you. I believe in you. I know you didn't do this and you're not alone. And they took my son from me. So after I got home, my sisters and I looked online for any kind of information of how this is even possible in the United States, because we just had no clue and we were lost. And there was no information online. So I personally started a blog, it's called Lady Justice Smith, going on two and a half years ago now, so that other people caught in these kinds of situations and scenarios would have a place to find information and support. I also purchased an RV and followed my son from prison to prison in the state of Washington throughout his sentence. Because I knew that the more contact he had with somebody, the better chances he had for re-entry and a real life, if that was even possible at this point. But the really sad thing in my mind is that this is all a big hoax. It's a big lie. They're not actually looking for people preying on children. I was personally molested at the age of 13. And I know that there are child predators out there. So why would the police go to the extent of trying to entice an innocent man into a scenario to capture them? Why? It doesn't make sense to me. Or it didn't back then. 
Why would they use the picture of an adult when the police are legally able to use the picture of a police officer when they were a minor? Why use a picture of an adult? No person looking for a child would actually continue a conversation after you send them a picture of an adult. It just doesn't make sense. But what I also learned was that a lot of people entrapped in these are either young, naive, impulsive men, or people who have some kind of cognitive, emotional deficiencies, such as on the spectrum of autism, and it makes them all an easy target. I also discovered that the police are paid for every arrest and prosecution that they make for someone that they label a child predator. Whether it's true or not, they still get the money. Now that does make sense. It's about the money. Attempt of rape of a child. For what purpose are they doing this for the society? Can't we keep our children safe and not prosecute innocent men? Not ruin their lives or the lives of their families and friends and their entire community? Why do this? Is anyone actually safer by these police proactive stings? There was no children saved. But my son went to prison. We all know to protect our young girls. I never thought to protect my son from a false accusation of a sex crime. And I would have never in a million years said my own government was behind it. Jace is now back home, and every once in a while, he'll look at me and say, hey mom, can I borrow the car? And uh, we look at each other and we give a little smile, and then, and, then, and then the sadness creeps back in, and I hug him, and I rub the back of his head, and I say, be careful, because we now know what can happen, and we will never be the same. And that is my story. I actually thought it would be easier if I showed you the video instead of sending it, but I don't think it was. Anyway. So that's about me. Now let me explain to you about ICAC. ICAC is uh, Internet Crimes Against Children. It was created. It was created by the Department of Justice. Thank you in 1998, and it was created for the purpose of combating heightened online activity by predators seeking unsupervised contact, potentially with underage victims. And so if you remember back to this period in your life, everybody had started to get a, a PC in their house. Okay, that was the new thing. We all had PCs, and we used to use our modem to dial out to the World Wide Web. And what people realized and they were scared about was that suddenly there's a back door into your house when you're on the web. You know, you don't think of it, but people were concerned about potentially uh, someone violating their financial information, watching what they're emailing. You know, Big Brother was watching and or worse, you know, a criminal. <clears throat> and this also brought in questions about keeping our children safe. So this basically, this ICAC campaign out of the Department of Justice was supposed to be internet police to keep us safe. And that was a valid reason to start this, and it had good intentions. But as early as 2001, ICAC made a report to the Department of Justice denying that undercover officers were manufacturing criminals. So it's been going on for two decades at least that um, ICAC has been trying to say, no, these are all, uh, most of these are from tips that we receive in our hotline, not police officers going online creating, creating um, criminals. So ICAC actually has a list of priorities that they're supposed to try to combat, and that is to help any child at immediate risk, which of course makes sense, and it goes down the list all the way through child pornography, trying to keep children safe, and everything makes sense, and it's all well-intended. Under the very last other child victimization, you would put police proactive stings, because there's no target, there's no information, there's no tip, there's no... There's no child pornography. It's just, who do you think is going to violate a child next? Let's see if we can guess. Additionally, at the time when it was created, the Department of Justice wanted help from the states. They needed the states to buy in. So they created a grant program that went along with this. And the grant program would use things such as this, the population of the state. There are now 61 ICAC task forces across the nation. Every state has one. Some states have more than one. 
But this is the math formula without the specifics. These are the items that go into figuring out how much each state or each ICAC office will get. The sad part here is that it has been um, added in that the number of leads and the number of successful prosecutions increase your money, your funding. So they have incentivized their performance, which becomes a problem. So because they started out with good intentions, but then put a monetary value upon it, this is actually what happened. Instead of them saving children, they actually create criminals. Chelsea's profile said she was a gamer. She was beautiful, looked about 22 to me. As a 20 year old, gaming and girls were the only things I cared about. We started talking and she told me she was 13. Yeah, right. Why would you post a profile if you were 13? You mean 23? The more we spoke, the more convinced I was, no way she was 13. Do you live alone? I can come over and play video games, maybe more. But I didn't find Chelsea. I was greeted by Detective Sarah Miller with the Vancouver Police Department. Before I could react, I was in a holding cell. My hands trembled as I dialed my parents. What would I tell them? We can fight this, Dad said. She was on an adult dating site. She sent you a picture of an adult, talked like an adult. What the cops did was entrapment, a bait and switch. The judge will see that. I fully cooperated with the police knowing I did nothing wrong. I didn't need a lawyer, did I? No one would believe what happened that the police fish for men on adults-only dating sites and then arrest them for being child predators when they're not. But why do this? For money, publicity, and notoriety. The police get millions in federal and state dollars to hunt for child predators. Higher the numbers, greater the funding they receive. Charged with a Class A felony, attempted rape of a child in the second degree and a Class C felony, Communication with the minor for immoral purposes. Ten years imprisonment with lifetime probation. Compulsory lifetime registration as a sex offender. The judge didn't see anything but the lie that was presented to her. Life is regulated now. No hookups, no messages. The only notifications I get are when I count the tally marks on my wall. A reminder of the time still left. A college dropout, no degree, no trade, no training. It will be hard to find a job, even harder to find a girlfriend or wife and raise children since I'm registered as a sex offender. My family has been destroyed. My parents have used all their savings trying to prove my innocence, only to have every door slammed in their face. I was a lonely guy looking for a good time. How was I turned into a predator stalking children? I guess all they needed was a computer and a cop professionally trained to lure, entice, and manipulate me into their trap. So who are the real predators in this story? Okay, I can get back to where I was. Maybe not. No. Ah, okay. I'm trying to get back to there. I'm stuck. Uh, yeah, but that's been wrong. No. Those are from the other thing. One second. Kind of get to that from there. Yeah, my. Okay, Duck season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we're really stuck there. I know, right? When you, when you get on that, does it? I would 
Oh, just open it. Maybe got it. No, okay. it's here. Haha! -ha. You're my hero. Are we in full screen? I don't know how to do that either. Here we go. Okay. Still shows it though, which is kind of weird. Okay. Anyway. So, how is this possible in the United States? This is what's happening. How is it possible? And that seems to be the question nobody can answer because whenever you explain to someone what's happening, they don't believe you. And since I experienced it, I know it's true. <laughs> so, I'm going to get a little scientific here. Uh, again, Jill's going to come into play here in a minute with biases, but um, the, the slight difference here is that I go through normal distribution. So if anybody's scientific in here, I'm a computer programmer, eh, not that I know this stuff, <laughs> different, different, different animal. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, the bell curve, does everybody understand the bell curve? The bell curve is in science, any stimulus will, will cause certain responses. So let's say you touch something hot, there are a number of valid responses that could happen to that stimulus. Uh, you might pull your hand away, certainly you would pull your hand away, you might shake your hand, you might curse or say ouch, you might do all sorts of things. None of those are invalid, they're all different responses. Some people might have some extreme responses that maybe aren't normal, for normal distribution, but they're still valid. For instance, there was a, a while ago, there was a campaign stop, drop, and roll, right, if you're on fire. So someone might actually like go down to the ground and get freaked out and, oh, I'm burnt. It's possible. I wouldn't do it, but their experience might kick off something that makes them do something that's a little out of the norm. The bell curve is about what's most often the response and what's less often a response. Okay, so the person that stopped, dropped, and rolled over getting his hand burnt would be an outlier. Their information, their response would be charted on the extremes of the bell curve with most, uh, most people would pull their hand away, maybe say, ouch, right? Doesn't mean they're, that they're not valid, just different. So a bell curve is a random variable we're trying to look for how people react to this or how that is responded to. Let's take a more common or simple, it's not simple, less simple, but more complex idea. When do NFL players retire? Okay. Once again, if you plot when all of the NFL players retire, you will see the bell curve. It's very common. It happened. That's why it's called normal distribution. It's normally what you get. You can see that most people retire at 33, but some retire at 24, some retire in their 40s. It's all normal with the outliers being the most, uh, the least common answer. So I think this is right. Yes, I'm on the right slide. So there is actually a game show that was made up completely of bell curve, normal distribution. The entire game show was about that. Does anybody have a clue what that might be? Don't even think about it, Aristotle. <laughs> Family Feud, <laughs> number one answer, guys. I mean, that was the bell curve it, at work. And uh, everybody knows it and everybody thinks about it. And we all think about what's the most common answers, but that's not always what somebody turns to. In fact, in Police Proactive Stings, and I have done surveys and I have talked to hundreds of families and I have talked to defense attorneys from different states. And I've cut it down to these eight. And within these eight, there are multiple, like, like the one about um, never believing a child. It could be role play, it could be catfishing. There's different things within each of these, but there's basically eight different scenarios that I have found to be valid, probably not defensible in a court, but that doesn't mean they're invalid reasons why somebody goes to try to uh, respond to a police proactive sex sting ad. One of those uh, reasons is that they are actually interested in sex with a child. That happens, we all know it happens. It's one of the reasons. But let's go back to our bell curve and let's try to plot these. The number one reason I've ever heard, the reason I hear most often, is that there is some form of role play going on. That's what these people think when they, they're on an adult site and somebody's like, oh, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm so cute. And yeah, it's role play. That's what we all know. And especially within the sexual context, that makes perfect sense because even us adults sometimes enjoy a little role play. Along with role play is catfishing. They know the other person is lying. They don't really know why they go to find out. Another reason is the psychology. And the whole thing here is that 
The police are trained to know psychology and how to get you to do what they want. So if you answer an ad and they say they're a minor, you might say, oh, this isn't for me, I'm not interested, in which case they will try to get you to come anyways. They will potentially send you a, a comment saying, well, I knew you, you were a flake, you're not gonna show up, you're not really a man. This goes to the psychology and your emotional response it has nothing to do with whether you wanted a child or not, and unfortunately, a lot of men fall for it. A very common thing I hear is that they want to help that child. And whenever I mention that someone might want to help a child and go to their aid, uh, immediately people start saying, well, why didn't they go through the cops? Well, not everybody trusts the cops. I will never go to a cop again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why people don't trust cops or don't want it. They don't want to look stupid. They don't whatever. But that doesn't mean that their reason why they went was not to help a child. It's a valid reason. The first case that was uh, successfully appealed in the state of Washington was for a man named Ken Chapman. He was in a uh, proactive sting in which there was a mother who wanted to uh, have somebody have sex with her children. And what happened in his case was that he repeatedly talked about having sex with her. She wanted him to talk about the children. He would say, well, if you'll have sex with me, I'll entertain the idea. He will tell you that he had no desire to have sex with the children. He was following her fantasies. But yet, um, they did convict him. He went to prison for a few years. His appeal said, the woman said she was gonna have sex with him. He showed up, you know, that's, that's entrapment, guys. You can't do that. And so he was released. But I'm explaining a valid reason why someone would show up, travel to the location. So misdeclarations, as I mentioned in the, in the videos, a lot of times the person is very young. We all know that 25 and under, under for men, they're, they're, not, they're impulsive. They don't think of consequences, you know, they're a little not all there. Uh, a lot of times, and my son has ADD, okay? So if you text him three messages, he's gonna read one, probably the last one, and he may completely miss what you told him. I guarantee he completely misses what you told him. And so misdeclarations happen, and that's a reason that I do hear about. As, additionally, not being told until they arrive, and Araceli just told me about a new person that, so in New Hampshire, there's a, a police scam going on where they'll get this text going and they'll arrange a meet and they haven't mentioned that they're not an adult and they're on an adult dating site, so they, it's assumed that you are an adult. You show up at the place, a public park, they text you, oh, you're gonna be mad, I'm really only 13, and then you're arrested. There are some people, I can tell you the story of an 18 year old out of California, who said, this isn't for me, I'm not interested in sex, but uh, he was lonely. He was 18 year old and a little, uh, you know, not socially inept. And he said, hey, come meet me in the park and we'll go smoke some pot together. And he was arrested for wanting to have sex with a minor. And then there are a few people who actually know that it's a sting and purposely go to get help. Sounds kind of counterintuitive. There was a man out of Pennsylvania who had done a number of tours in Afghanistan. He had severe PTSD. He knew it was a sting. He had found a number of them online. He purposely answered one and went. It's almost like suicide by cop. He thought his family would be better off without him, and they were without him, but then he quickly realized he had put himself in a worse position. There was another man who had a heavy drug addiction and thought if he was in prison, perhaps he would be able to quit the habit and get medical help. He is in prison, he didn't get any medical help. And then, as I've already mentioned, a valid reason is that they are interested in sex with children. We all know those people exist, they're out there, but what I found is that there's about one out of 10. About one out of 10 people who answer this ad have some kind of inkling or could easily be persuaded. Maybe they have something in their background, what have you. So in talking to all the families, I mostly speak to the nine out of 10 families, but there is somebody who's interested and there is a valid reason for police proactive stings. Were they to be operated correctly to find that one out of 10? Unfortunately, all 10 of these people will go to prison. So there's another piece to this. Let's put the bell curve on the side. We understand what's going on there. There's another piece to this and that goes along with the incentives for performance. It's called a perverse incentive in financial circles. 
And this is what happens. What do dolphins have to do with cobras? More than you might think. Back in the first years of the 20th century, Delhi, India, had a lot of cobras slithering around and upsetting the sensibilities of the occupying British aristocracy. Wanting to reduce the cobra population, they thought, We should put a bounty on these things! I know! We'll pay people for every severed cobra tail they bring us! But cobras can live and breed without their tails. And it didn't take the locals long to figure out that they could get paid for a severed cobra tail without killing the cobra. Cobra breeding operations started up, and the number of cobras in Delhi actually increased. The results became so infamous that Authority Instituted Pest Control dubbed it the Cobra Effect. And this isn't just about snakes. The French occupation of Vietnam in the early 1900s had a similar problem. Sacre bleu! There's too many rats! We should put a bounty on these things! I know! We'll pay people for every severed rat tail they can bring us! As you may have guessed, the total number of rats in the area, albeit tailless ones, increased. And as recently as 2007 in Fort Benning, Georgia, feral pigs became an issue. In what was the proposed solution? Ah! Bounty! Tail! You'll get the picture. As a result, there were a suspicious number of tailless feral pigs running around. And domestic pigs were also starting to mysteriously lose their tails. Ha! Ah, it's too bad those societies were so profit-driven. Ah, but that's the thing. This isn't about society. It's about us. Which brings me to dolphins. When a group of dolphins were trained to bring the trash and dead seagulls that would end up in their enclosures to their handlers in exchange for a treat for each piece of debris, one of them quickly learned to tear apart each piece of trash and gull to maximize the number of rewards. The other dolphins picked up on the scheme and then took it further, going so far as to hunt gulls and drag in nearby trash just so they could rip them apart to exchange the pieces for rewards. The moral of the story? It's not the intentions behind policy that affects people, or animals, behavior. It's the incentives. And no matter the society, or even species, that's always going to be the case. Hey, could you give me a ride? I've got a wedding to go to. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please check out fee.org for more educational content. Thank you. It's a hard button. Okay, so we have two different sides of what's happening here. We've got the bell curve, which, what, which is what's really happening in normal, and we have the incentive side. Both of them start to come together. So, in 2015, 2014, the lead detective out of Washington State for a division called MECTIF, Missing and Exploited Children's Task Force, which is a direct subsidiary of ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children, the lead detective had a task force of two people, and he's about to be defunded. They're about to be broke apart because they don't have enough money to keep them running. So he has to figure out how to save his job, save his task force, and he goes to a conference in the end of 2014 for ICAC, and he comes back with this idea. And he's put together that he can make money and help support his task force. So, uh, and this is not new. I wanted to bring up that, you know, this has happened in other places. For instance, I don't know if you guys saw the Hulu documentary about the New York uh, Police Department, how they were having quotas for arrests to try to get more money to circulate into the city. Uh, it's called crime and punishment. And that's where they um, coined the phrase collars for dollars. So they would literally just arrest anybody because they knew they'd have to go in or pay the fine have to go in in front of the court, they don't want to do that, they don't have a lawyer, they don't have the money, they just either pay it or they ignore it, which they were really excited about because then they can actually file a, you know, a warrant against them and it's, it's all this big, it's actually a scam and so you should really watch Crime and Punishment. But anyway, so Carlos is here and he's put these two together, probably a whisper in his ear at the ICAC convention, hey, guess what we're trying, we're doing this. So suddenly he has this idea. Now, every year, ICAC has to submit a report for their performance that says how many of each of these things they did. 
And those things include things like training of their officers or public outreach for information about what could happen. And this is all based loosely upon stranger danger because they're trying to push that myth because ICAC is about supposedly men online trying to seek children. And we know that does happen. It does happen. But it is not to the degree that, that they're trying to push you to think. Like, they're, they want the public to think this is happening all the time and they're helping to save us. Anyways, they have to submit a, a performance report once a year. And under that are different categories. One of them is for travelers. A traveler is if they talk to somebody online, they talk them into coming to a meet. At that meet, the police will be there. They're called a traveler. There are proactive or reactive travelers. Reactive being that somebody called in a tip or told the police, hey, this guy is creepy. They connect with him online. He travels to a meet location and he is nabbed. But the interesting part about this is that in 2015, although there's not a lot of, of work done here in the traveler arrests, you can see that proactively not much is going on. And they do have a few reactive uh, arrest, but within this category, within two years, it's over 500% go up. So something changed here. And this is true on their performance reports across the line between communicating with a minor, child pornography, blah, blah, blah. All of it starts to go up in the preactive, uh, proactive segment and go down in the reactive. And that's very important. It shows a time frame where things changed. But his biggest problem was convincing everybody that the only reason someone would show up was because they were interested in children. So how do you do that? How do you convince the public, your, your superiors, the media, that instead of being one out of 10, it is now the number one reason why someone would show up? That requires some, some fancy dialogue. So I want to go into some concepts about how that could happen. And Mark Twain has this really cool, how easy it is to make people believe a lie. And that's very true, especially if you're coming out with something new. So the state of Washington did not have proactive sting campaign before Net Nanny. And that's what they, they dubbed it, Net Nanny. And so when Net Nanny came out, the media was suddenly saying, hey, the police are going out and they're trying to arrest all these people that are, that are online searching for your children and let's give them our support, right? So that's the first thing that hit people's consciousness. And the first thing to hit your consciousness is often what you're gonna take for fact, whether it is or not. There was a, uh, a young man, he was 14 years old, and in the 1997, he created a petition at his school to ban dihydrogen monoxide. And this chemical, this chemical was prevalent throughout the entire school system. It had caused a lot of deaths. And in its um, liquids, in its gas state, it is uh, toxic. It will cause burns. And it is the leading agent of uh, acid rain. It's the number one component for acid rain. And it was being used at the school. So he started a petition. And he got most of his classmates to sign the petition. And then he turned it in as his science experiment with the title of How Gullible Are We? Because dihydrogen oxide, monoxide is H2O. And yes, it is the main ingredient of acid rain and causes deaths from drowning. Yeah, so how gullible are we? And so part of what, part of what he, he focused upon was selective communication. I'm gonna tell you the truth, but I'm gonna word it in a way that maybe is omitting some of the other facts, lead you to what I want you to think. So, Carlos Rodriguez wants to make everybody believe that everybody that answers these ads is interested in a child. How can he do that? Well, we all know that law enforcement and prosecutors are trained. They're literally trained how to use biases. If you have ever seen an interrogation or heard of one, good cop, bad cop, that's using a bias, that's using emotional manipulation, um, they're trained to get you to tell them information. Prosecutors are trained how to sway a jury. You think that's all the facts? No, it's a lot of art and smoke and mirrors and their framing of how they're saying things. Yes, Jill, framing. So, so uh, there's a lot of biases and these are just some of the, the main ones that come into play, but an uh, implicit bias 
is our stereotypes. Men only want one thing. Of course, men don't only want one thing, but that is a normal thing that, that people think, and it's thought to be true. It's a stereotype. Then there's confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is building off of an implicit bias. So these men were arrested. They must have done something wrong. And of course they did because we know that men only want one thing. So it all makes sense that they were arrested for this. And confirmation bias is used off of what you already believe to enhance. Yeah, that, that's what happened. I knew it. Anchoring bias is comparing things. So in the state of Washington, as mentioned in the video, uh, attempted rape of a child will get you six to 10 years. That's the normal, that's the normal sentence for attempted rape of a child. That is also the normal, normal sentence range for rape of a child, six to 10 years. And so comparing those, they would use the, the theory that, well, it's almost the same thing, so they should get the same thing. But there's two problems here. One of them is that that clause used in the state of Washington for attempted rape of a child was created in 1975. There was no internet. We didn't have anything that would even resemble a police proactive sexting. Okay, it wasn't even an option. The clause was created for when someone tried to attempt, some, uh, attempt a, a rape of someone and they were interrupted. A passerby heard them scream or they fought off their attacker. They wanted to give the same penalty as if it had happened. And that does make sense. But using it online for a police, pro police you know, crafted incident, that doesn't make sense. It's a clause from 1975. The second problem is that in the state of Washington, there's something called SOSA, Sex Offender Sentencing Alternative. It's a diversion program to keep families together. You don't want to pull the breadwinner out of the family it will keep the mother from you know, cooperating with the authorities. The child doesn't want to be the cause of this problem. And so SOSA is a diversion. So what happens in the state of Washington is if, let's say a stepfather violates his stepdaughter, the stepfather gets a year of prison time and then he's back home to take care of the family and work his job and maintain community liabilities and responsibilities. The police proactive sexting where no child was harmed, that person is not available for the diversion because they don't know the victim. They go to prison for six to 10 years. The last um, bias I wanna show you is the framing effect, which is a psychological tool. It's set up to get a desired response. This is how you present yourself. So let's take a survey over a product. The product is listed in this survey two different ways. I'm 99% fat free or I'm 1% fat. Which product would you buy? Uh, overwhelmingly, they bought the 99% fat free, even though the science says it's the same exact health risk here, right? Doesn't matter. Now they changed it and they said, okay, I'm 98% fat free, 1% fat. Crazily, 98% fat free still won out, even though it is the less healthy of the two. It's framing how you present it. Everybody wants to be fat free. I want to be fat free, but it doesn't work. So that's all, it's facts, but they're twisted to sound a certain way. But at some point, the facts become untrue, fake news, propaganda. And that has to do with spinning. Spinning is media bias that clouds your view. It keeps out information that would make you get to what somebody who had all the facts would come to, the same conclusion. You can find this most often with politicians. They need something from you, and they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Now, they could go on a, a platform of this, that, or the other, and whether they follow through with that really has nothing to do with their platform. They may or may not. You have no control after that point. They want something from you, and they're speaking to you. It's so funny, too, because the places where you hold press conferences are called spin rooms. And we know that spinning is where you cross the line from framing into fake which is kind of, you know, not surprising that these politicians want something from you and they're going to spin. Spin is a language which has designs on us. It is not telling you the fact. It is not trying to persuade you one way or the other. It's a lie. It needs you. So it's going to convince you whatever it takes to get to a certain perspective. In one of the cases, the Vancouver Police Department put out through the uh, media 
They said that the net nanny was designed to locate and arrest individuals whose sole purpose is the sexual exploitation and abuse of children. They did not mention anywhere in the article that they posted on adults-only websites. They did not mention that they sent pictures of adults. They did not mention that adults were at the meet. So is that spinning or is it framing? So much so have these um, spinning now adjusted the ideas of net nanny in the state of Washington that the police themselves and prosecutors are on board with this and think, seem to think that they're doing the right thing, which is amazing to me. In the New York Times article, uh, a police captain was quoted as saying that proactive stings versus reactive stings are a meager investment that pay huge dividends. We're talking about comparing someone who harmed no one to someone who was violated. I don't understand how it is that that person with a straight face could talk about whether or not it paid a dividend on their investment. They've lost the mark of what's important. The pr prosecutor out of Washington State in the same article discussed how a 10-year sentence is appropriate. It's appropriate if you have diversion, maybe. It's not appropriate for someone who harmed no child. And she also stated that the people caught in these were just as dangerous as the ones who actually assaulted children. That woman has let the framing and the spinning change her philosophy. It has no reality. She doesn't know that they're more dangerous or not. There's no proof of that. The police officers themselves, and we uh, got this information by doing a Freedom of Information Act. We collected some emails between police officers um, while we were investigating Carlos Rodriguez, who was the lead, uh, they talk to each other and say, hey, why don't you come on out and play? Let's see if we can chat some guys in. Nowhere is it mentioned that let's save some children who might be in danger. The philosophy here, the mindset, has turned into an adrenaline game that these people are looking for a payoff out, out of. They're not thinking about the children. They're not thinking about the men that they might be accusing of this and ruining their lives. And of course, Hitler said it best, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and they will believe you. And that is exactly what's happening with police proactive stings at this time. I do believe there was a time where they were run correctly before states figured out the perverse incentive. But if you look at the statistics, you'll see that it's no longer doing what it is intended to do. So what can we do? How can we help this? Number one thing you gotta do is you gotta research what you're gonna talk about. You have to know it backwards and forwards, inside and out. You have to know the statutes. And this is very difficult because as you all know, this is across 50 states. And how do you understand all the differences? Um, a negative for the state of Washington is that there are no statutes specifically for the online crime. A lot of states have a statute for the online crime and they have appropriately, or so they think, um, sentences for that. We're going to the 1975 statute. It, it's all different in every state, but they're all doing the same thing, tricking people. But you have to know what you're talking about. One of our members was very adamant that I include that you should come up with an alternative when you're talking to, say, your legislators. Don't just go, hey, this isn't working and it's not fair. What should they do? What could they do? And her point was that there are no alternative solutions to a real problem. The real problem is that children are getting hurt. 95% are being hurt by someone in their family or their communities that they already know. And another supposedly 5% are being hurt online, be it stranger danger, which the statistic out of the FBI is that it's about approximately 300, 21 year old and younger, 300 a year who's actually a stranger danger. That's pretty minuscule to the number of children who are harmed in this country. But they're pushing that scenario as, as if it was the 5%. We all know it's not. But across the country, is there a national campaign to tell a person how to recognize if they're online and somebody is grooming them for, say, you know, something nefarious? There isn't. Is there a national campaign to say how to know what to do if your stepfather is, is you know? Is there a national campaign to give people facts, to give, to give families a way to understand and have an, a, a proactive approach? There is none. There is a proactive sting that tries to catch 
potentially innocent people. Offer the real, real solutions, which would be national campaigns such as that. The last one is collect reported data. So, as I mentioned, the uh, ICAC uh, task force all have to send in their performances every year. So right now, Araceli is one of them, we have a work group that's trying to get all of the state's performance review submissions since they started getting paid uh, um, their funding from the Department of Justice. So we're trying to collect all those to see the patterns and see when things switch and see when we went from reactive gumshoe following an actual investigation to proactive trying to make money being a police officer. Unfortunately, we have to find our own data. Uh, someone questioned me as to why I would say that the, the ICAC reporting would be accurate. Well, it's accurate or overblown because they're getting funded off of the ICAC reporting. So I can be pretty sure that those are ac accurate. Unfortunately, my history is with police uh, reporting, and so I happen to know that for every incident in every state every month, there's a report sent to the FBI. It goes to the United Crime Reporting database, and so they know about every incident. And so I was like, ding, okay, so let me go on there and try to track all the police-initiated um, sexual offenses. So I went online and I said, okay, give me all the juvenile and rape of a child, juvenile, without a victim. I thought, well, that would work, right? So I'm scrolling down and I'm looking and there's, you know, adult, child, handicapped, minority, all different ways of describing the victim, but there is no checkbox for no victim. So I, I literally wrote them. And I wrote them at crimestatsinfo at fbi.gov. That's who I had a conversation with back and forth over a period of about two weeks. And I said, how can I find out all these proactive sting cases? How can I identify them in the crime reporting? Because every one of them is reported and I know it. And the guy came back and said, oh yeah, well, uh, anything that's a sexual offense has to have a victim. I said, but you know there isn't a victim. And he said, you're right, there isn't. And I get asked this a lot. And he said, so we report it as if the victim was who the police officer was representing. So in my son's case, there's a case out there in the UCR that says a 13-year-old was online looking for sex with an adult and that my son attempted to rape her. This is our government, the FBI, and that is the point where I say this is a conspiracy. Sorry, that was huge to me. So I went back and forth and I said, why do you not have a box? For, you know this is happening. Oh, well, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you can't just get a new. And I said, well, okay, 9-11, we have a lot of new terrorists, you know, lots of, was this a hate crime, LGBTQ? We know that things get changed on these forms all the time. I said, why is there no box for police proactive things? Is there another indicator that you could, no, 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 no. And he says to me, and I assume it's a him, he says to me, well, it takes a long time. You know, you can't just add a box. And I'm like, okay, I get that, uh, you know, I, I understand bureaucracy. And so he says, someone has to write a white paper and you have to submit it to be evaluated, which takes about a year. And then it goes to the UCR subcommittee. And then it goes to the APB, which I thought was all points bulletin, but you know, I'm, yeah. And then it goes to the director of the FBI to sign off on. So it takes about two years to get a change in. And I, and I wrote back and I said, well, I know these have been happening for at least two decades. There's plenty of time, right? So there's, there was one that came through and it got denied, or how do I do it? He says, write to your legislator. I said, well, hasn't somebody else or No. Is there plans to do this in the future? No. <laughs> Can I get your name? No. Yeah. So you have to come up with your own information. So one of the things that really helped us, Cage, as a group, one of our three founding families, one of the guys was not a programmer like me, but a data guy, and he made up a, a spreadsheet of the th approximately 300 men who were caught in the state of Washington under net nanny. And he filled it out with all of the information. What sentence did they get? What charge did they get? How old were they? What year did it happen? Which sting was it? Blah, 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 it was great. And that piece of data collection is what got us into the New York Times. Data is the way to the media because they can't fight the data. If they look up anything on there, they'll find it's true. So how do they fight that? They can't. 
So the New York Times actually, uh, in their article, coined that 89% had no possession of CP, which although CP does not mean you will violate, most violators have CP if they were intentionally looking for a child. 92% have no history of violent crime that they're collecting. This person has no history of ever even, no cyber tips, no somebody thinks he's creepy, nothing. And that's kind of an indicator to maybe you've got the wrong guy. In the state of Washington, we managed to get a WISP study we got the funding for it out of the legislature just this last year. And so within the next year, they're going to compare pre-2015 people arrested for these crimes, reactive, versus the proactive sting people. What do they not have in common? Well, we already know what they don't have in common. They had no intention. They had no history of it. They had no predisposition of it. And they're going to see that this doesn't quite make sense. So that's really cool. But I needed information quicker, so I created a survey. And I have about 125 responses now, not nearly as many as people have been caught in these stings, which are tens of thousands. And I really need to get more people to respond to this. And I was thinking I might take an ad out in the NARSOL uh, flyer. And, um, but, uh, so what, part of what kicked off my survey was that I was on the Dr. Phil show, and I had the opportunity to ask one question. That was the only time I was given, even though they, they, of course, tell you you can ask all sorts of questions. Well, I, I got one question in. And my question was, if in a proactive sting you are really trying to save children, why do you not then follow up your arrest with an investigation into that person's home to search for potentially other victims that this person has, you know, to corroborate your evidence, make it even stronger? Why do you not search the home and their computers? And the officer who was out of Fresno, California, that was on the Dr. Phil show said, we do. I've been through this. They didn't search my home. I know that's not true. So I wanted to find out for myself. And so that was one of the questions that's on my survey. And the answer is 30%. 30% of the homes are actually checked. So if they're really interested in children, they're not that interested as to find other children. Another sick, uh, sick result out of my survey is that seven, only 17% 17, 17 never left their house who get arrested for this. Uh, I'm not, is that like comparative to the old time where you had a phone and you talked dirty and then they came to your house? It never happened. So I'm not sure how that one happens, but 17% never left their house, yet they were still arrested and prosecuted. So another thing you can do is you can find out who is suffering from the perverse incentive. So they are taking resources from cyber tips, people calling in, this guy is creepy. They're taking resources from that and they're putting it to where they make the most money. We've already seen that, how that works. So who's suffering? Well, the people that aren't getting the gumshoe investigation are certainly suffering. And so you could reach out to uh, groups of, of survivors, victims, and tell them, hey, you know, uh, there's a category for when there's an arrest, there's a category for how the closure is, how the case get closed. And there's an exceptional closure. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. There's something called exceptional closure. And what happens in a real case, somebody was raped, if they're exceptionally closed, there could be a number of reasons. The witnesses are flaky, the, the victim refuses to testify and press charges, or uh, any number of reasons why they don't have enough to, to prosecute this guy. That's an exceptional closure. Those are up. And I don't think they're up because of any reason other than they're not spending the time on it anymore because they're doing proactive things, which they know will get them the payoff they want because the only witness is a police officer who everybody is automatically tuned in to believe whether it's true or not. Fortunately, the tide is changing on that. Legislators, legislators are making legislation that they want to help the society. No, we've told a few legislators in Washington state that they're using the statute from 1975. They weren't happy. <laughs> they were not happy. Taxpayers are paying for all of this, all of the funding for putting away criminals who didn't harm a child. And the public safety is being hurt because they're telling us they're saving us. But yet these people didn't harm a single child and nobody was saved. So what you can do in those scenarios when you're going to talk to, say, a rape, uh, a rape victim group who helps support them afterwards, you might say that ICAC is saying these things. We are keeping communities safe by catching violent predators before they commit 
a crime against a child. But we can flip those words, and just as true is that reported rape prosecutions are falling, leaving, leaving rapists free in our community, while men accused of thought crimes fill our prisons. Do you think they'd be as excited about that? Doesn't sound as uh, positive for the ICAC. Rapists walk free because prosecuting them is not a good return on investment. Let's let them all out. Proactive sex stings create overtime. The fact is that if you're working a case, a reactive case, somebody was harmed, you do that on your shift, nine to five or whatever that may be. It's not, it's not a cause for overtime, but the proactive stings, come on out, chat some guys in, make some money for Christmas. Yeah, stings get overtime pay. What do I want to happen? What I want to happen is I would love to see these completely defunded. That would be my number one choice. Uh, the, the study that we have going, that's a good start towards defunding in the state of Washington. But if that's not possible, then I'd like to see them continue but have required criteria. Right now, there's a book out of DOJ. It's called The Investigative Techniques. It has some mandates for what they're supposed to do. They don't do it, but it's not a law. They get away with it. The cops don't care. Nobody's shutting them down. And the juries are believing them because the prosecutors doing their job and convincing them that this person is dangerous. I would also like to see some external oversight. Right now, the DOJ, which are police, Department of Justice, oversee ICAC, police, Department of Justice, and the state's, the state's police department. Those are the people who oversee ICAC's program. Okay, so they're already in it. <laughs> Nobody externally has said, uh, wait a minute guys, why are you doing this? So to conclude it, I am now a civil rights advocate. I never wanted to be, and I still don't want to be, but I will be up here saying my spiel until people don't listen to me or the proactive things stop. Uh, in my opinion, this is a, now a conspiracy, and it's the logical evolution of a, of a perverse incentive, and we have to present science-based data in order to get ourselves heard. Here's how you can reach us. I hope that you learned something, and we'd be happy for your assistance. Thank you all. Could you tell me what the appellate courts, I assume that you appealed your son's decisions. How did the appellate court justify the lower courts and how were you able to appeal up to this Washington State Supreme Court and then you okay, can take so it up? Okay, so we do have one case in front of the Supreme we do have one case in front of the Supreme Court, um, and that is because in the state of Washington, they're denying our ability to use entrapment. They won't even let us say that it's entrapment. And so it went in front of the Supreme Court because of an appellate uh, ruling. That is not my son. My son won his appeal, not because of, no, don't shake your head, it's even worse. Not because of the merits of the case, but because of a technicality. He did not waive the right to a jury, and um, his lawyer did it for us, him against our wishes, which is a no-no. So he was recharged, and now I get to pay twice for an attorney. I am now in over 100 grand of cash. Any other questions? I, over, over here. Um, you said that you talked to the statistician at the Bureau of Prisons and that they did not have any way of tracking. The FBI, this, not the Bureau of okay, Prisons. The stings. Yes. But apparently, I'm wondering how you got the 300 in Washington. Were they tracking them? No, we tracked them. How, One of how the did founding. You, I want to know how you found them. <laughs> it was a lot of work. So in the state of Washington, they actually put out press releases saying how great of a job they're doing. They list the names and where everybody's from and their ages. And we pulled off all of the media. We followed those cases through looking them up on the portal. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Thank you. Yep. Now Sue's going to ask me a question. So I just wanted to know, how many times have you done this presentation? One. Are you serious? Is this it? This is it. 
I'm like blown away. I mean, Aww, thank you. So everybody who, <laughs> I thank you guys. So I always feel really bad because everybody who knows me, I can't sit for like longer than five minutes. So you'll see me go up and down. And I always, I never want to be rude. But I mean, I just couldn't leave. Thank you. Very I appreciate good that. When I was practicing, one of my teammates said, "This really builds. It was great." I was like, <laughs> "Yeah." Thank so, you. what I want to know is that the film that you showed at the very beginning. Yeah. Is that something that's out there to be distributed? It's on Florida Action Committee website. It's is it their really? campaign. They have a number of different. So they actually paid for us to have a coach to learn how to say what we needed to say, and it was great. And there's a number of different families. They all. They I think I think that was one of the most yeah. compelling uh, short films like that I've ever seen. That Thanks. was really good. Thank, Thank you. you for what you're doing. There's a lot of people out there who will appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned this just briefly at the end, but maybe to expand just a bit. It sounds like that in your case in particular, one of the core issues was that you're not advocating that necessarily these things couldn't occur in situations where the person was intending to meet a minor for sex and mm -hmm. knew the, her age and mm -hmm. had no doubts about that. But it seems like the law, as you said, was 1975, doesn't address any of those points. Not in Washington, yeah. Have you, see, yeah, have you seen examples or other places that are, are like, what, what would, a rational law like that look like? Like what, like what would go into that or how? Well, I don't know that it would be the law as much as the Department of Justice putting down mandates for what the police could or couldn't use in an investigation, in my opinion. Because there are other states who have addressed that if there's a you know online no victim kind of scenario, this is the sentencing. But still, the, they, they get paid for the prosecution. The police get paid in funding for the prosecution. So you have to remove their ability to get the funding unless they follow X rules. And that's not going to happen unless the states were to make specific you know, statutes that said you can't use an adult in a picture. That's not allowed. And in fact, as you called, I did when this first happened, called around to all the different ICAC offices. And one lady out of, of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. She said, we can't, we can't use pictures of adults. Where, where did this happen? And they don't even follow like each other's rules. I mean, it's just, if your state will let you get away with it, that's what the police do. The more and more they can get away with, that's, that's where they're going. Thank you. Oh, um, so, uh, Dr. Dr. Hambrick, thank you so much for your Oh, I am not a doctor. I'm a mom. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, Mother Hambrick, thank you so much for your presentation. Yes. I, I found it very insightful, um, despite the fact that, you know, I, my conviction wasn't stimulated, but still. So, uh, I'm sure you know about online vigilante sting groups yes. who try to act like the police, and they oftentimes claim that they do a better job than the police because, oh, you know, police, you know, don't don't do enough or they don't respond fast enough. It's they're they're the real heroes. They're the ones doing right. the real policing. Is there a study, in fact, that these online vigilante groups do a better job than the police? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, no, there is no study that I know of. Uh, there's no study I know of about police proactive things at all, other than the one that we've just got funding for in the state of Washington. But interesting for you, I, I the Mike Morse podcast interview that I did, and that is the attorney for Chris Hansen. He is pro vigilante, and he had had a number of vigilantes on his podcast and was encouraging them and talking to them about their successes. And so I went on it as the flip side. I said, are you going to show the other side of that? Or, you know, a real reporter or a real attorney? And so they fell for it. And anyways, um, so you might want to hear that one. Um, but there's nobody that, uh, no, there's no study. OK. Well, I'm. I'm sure you've heard of the nefarious uh, creep catchers from all around yes, Canada. Yes, the guy's name was Ghost. I heard ghosts. Uh, so does anybody know about Bonnie Burkhardt's book? I have a copy out on the table. It has to do with creating uh, creating criminals, manufacturing criminals. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about, um, sorry, she talks about the, the legalities of it because she works in the Department of Justice. 
Well, I, I think a lot of these uh, creep catcher groups tend to say, oh, well, we know about entrapment, so it's like we're not going to uh, say that we're, that we're going to admit that we're actually children and that we're not going to even talk about sex. Um, we're just going to let them do it. And, you know, lo and behold, the, the predators, quote unquote, right. show up to you right. know, their camera place, wherever do it is. Do they catch more than the real police? I'm not sure. There's no incentive for them other than notoriety. So I'm not sure. I would say they have a better chance of it if they really are looking for and if they follow the rules. Like, you can't bait them with a picture of an adult. I mean, how do you then know? Yeah. But I would imagine they'd have a better chance, but still notoriety is big and they do get funding from people sending in donations. So once again, it's they, still monetary. They do sell a lot of their merchandise and a lot of these uh, creep catchers aren't working any other job. They're right. legally considered unemployed. Right. And so. So I don't, I don't think that there, if there was someone who took no benefit from it at all and was trying to just maybe, mm -hmm. But still, you can't know what someone will do. Don't we have enough criminals? Do we have to make them? <laughs> okay. Thank you. you. You've you've talked about entrapment, and entrapment is a really big question that kind of floats around these things. Right. I mean, in I can tell you that in South Carolina, our attorney general has made his political career on these campaigns. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what he is about. That's how he's made his name. Big money. And uh, they love it. And he's uh -huh. out in the press telling how many creeps he's and perverts and predators yeah. he's locked up. Um, my question is, what is, is there any legal definition of entrapment? What are they allowed to do and not allowed to do? It's as clear as mud, and it's different yeah. state by state, and it has to do with objective versus subjective, and having to do with intent in one way or what the cops can and can't do, and they're different by state. And so uh, there's no clear answer for you. Um, but all of them are supposed to include uh, predisposition to this crime because the whole idea is that you're merely affording this opportunity to somebody that you have no hand in whether they take it or not which is not true with the police ones mm -hmm. so at that point we show inducement you sent a picture of an adult who's fully capable of having sex so uh, so yeah that that's where sorry the line is okay thank you